change your mind And I know It's me That followed you with mine I could say that you didn't mean But you wanted me Maybe I was wrong Even want wasn't anything So if we had Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, before we get into our topic, just a couple of thank yous I want to make. Uh, big thank you to Kelly Blake at WashU um, and Jamie Norton at Williams for their work in creating this coaching discussion today. Thank you to USTF CCCA for promoting and streaming this event, and then to all of our great panelists that we have today. So to lead us into um, you know, the purpose of this discussion. Our topic today will be highlighting career paths and coaching uh, with a focus on various factors and choices that coaches might take into consideration when it comes to making career decisions. And while we'll be hearing from coaches in division three track and cross country programs uh, from around the country, I think a lot of what we might be talking about today can really be applied outside of our division and outside of our sport as well. So we're gonna get started with introductions. Um, I'll let each participant introduce themselves, share who you are, your current school and coaching position, uh, total years in the profession and at your current program. So let's get started with Nicole. Hey, hi, my name is Nicole Wilkerson and I'm the head men's and women's cross country coach, assistant track and field coach for men and women at Middlebury College, which is in Vermont. I've been at Middlebury since 2001 um, and have been coaching for a total of between 23 and 24 years total. Awesome, thanks. Let's go to Emma. Hi everyone, my name is Emma Dallara. I've been coaching for 12 years. I currently serve as the Associate Women's Cross Country and Track and Field Coach at Pomona Pittsburgh College, which is located in Southern California and I've been there for eight years. Great, let's go to Kenneth. Uh, my name is Kenneth Cox. I'm the head cross country and track coach here at Birmingham Southern College. Um, I uh, started here uh, at Birmingham Southern in 2008. Um, and so I just uh, completed my 12th year um, and I've been coaching for uh, 15 years uh, collegially. Thanks, and Carrie? Hey everybody, I'm Carrie Cleckone. I'm the head women's track and field coach at North Central College in Naperville, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. Um, I am finishing my 25th year of collegiate coaching and my 18th year at North Central College. Awesome. And I'm Katie Wagner. I am at University of Wisconsin La Crosse in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, I've been coaching for 13 years and um, 12 of those years have been at lacrosse. And I am currently the head assistant coach for the women's track and field program there. Um, so we're gonna get into our first question. Um, we're going to highlight one major decision that you had to make during your coaching career that had a major impact on where you are today in the profession. 
So let's go ahead and start with Carrie. Oh boy. Um, my major coaching decision I made was to go into coaching. First of all, I did an undergraduate degree in education and my master's, I went back to, I went to Wisconsin lacrosse and I um, competed for Wisconsin lacrosse. And my coach asked me, coach Pat Healy to come back. My major, my mentor, um, close friend um, asked me to come back to be his first graduate assistant. So the first uh, big coaching decision I made was to even leave the, um, the, co the teaching profession. I thought I was going to be an educator in Wisconsin uh, when I got out of school and decided to go to lacrosse to be a GA. But the real major decision I made, and this hopefully will um, ring true for a lot of people as they've tried to decide their path, was I decided I'd go wherever the greatest opportunity came. You know, I was willing to look wherever the job was going to be, um, be able, think about moving and moving again if necessary to have the path that I wanted within my coaching profession. My first job I ever had um, outside of graduate school um, was starting a team from scratch at Texas Lutheran University. It hadn't been in existence for 20 years. And I was uh, hired at really my first job was full time as a head coach, starting a team from, from not existing. Um, that was NAI moving to division three with no scholarship money within the school itself. But um, really it just came down to, I was willing to look everywhere. You know, I applied and was offered a part-time position in Arizona at the same time. Um, I wasn't tied to an area. It was about being willing to get out there and take a risk and, and see, you know, see where it would take me. Um, and that one big move to Texas really set me up on a trajectory um, to where I am today. Awesome. Uh, let's hear from Emma. So one major decision I had to make at the time was choosing not only the career path I wanted to take, but also turning down an, uh, another job opportunity. When the position at Pomona Pacer College opened up, I just knew that I had to take the risk and dive right into it. Also meant making the decision to turn down a position of running a family business, which at the time was really tough to make. But looking back, I also knew that, looking back, I know it's, it was the right decision. Um, I also knew that in order to pursue coaching, which at the time and currently is a passion that I have, I had to dive right in. And as a result, I am, you know, I'm still coaching at Pomona Pitzer and I think it was the right decision to make at the time. But that was a tough decision to make, but I'm glad that I made it. Great. How about Kenneth? Um, <clears throat> my, uh, I guess my biggest decision uh, really was, um, was accepting the job uh, here at Birmingham South. Um, my wife and I uh, had, uh, had been living in, in Atlanta for six years. Uh, we had um, you know, been married five years uh, of the six before um, given this opportunity um, to, uh, to coach here at Birmingham Southern. Uh, we're originally from North Carolina, both my wife and I. Um, and, you know, our, um, our goal all along was to be able to move back home to North Carolina, um, to be back closer to, to family. Um, and when the opportunity presented itself for me to come down and help build a program, uh, it truly was a step of faith. Um, didn't know anyone in the state of, of, uh, of Alabama, um, let alone having you know, visited Birmingham maybe once or twice uh, on our travels uh, to New Orleans. Um, but, um, but really just, um, you know, just talked, uh, talked to good friends and, and family. Um, and, uh, and this was an opportunity for me uh, really uh, um, to, to, uh, to just see what, what God had for me. Um, and, um, and so in doing that, um, you know, uh, met some amazing, amazing people here um, that welcomed me in. Um, you know, it was an opportunity for me to, uh, to see, um, you know, just to see really what, what, um, what this coaching opportunity had, um, you know, we had started the program, um, in 2006 was the first year that they added track and field, uh, 2007 was the first season. Um, and so, you know, building a program, um, and, and, and really just, um, just being able to do it, you know, our way. Um, I was, I was hired as the assistant coach, um, to help build the program. And then after my first year, um, I was promoted to head coach. Um, and so um, that leap of faith, uh, that opportunity really to, um, to just trust God every way, um, it really, really, uh, um, you know, just changed my entire life. And, 
and uh, 12 years later, I'm here, uh, I'm happily married. I didn't. What I didn't say also is that my uh, my wife actually um, uh, did not move with me. Uh, she had another opportunity uh, that we had prayed about, and so we were here. I was here actually for a year uh, without my wife and our one-year-old daughter, um, and so that was a, a huge, huge uh, challenge for us. Um, but um, but we we remain to stay the course. And um, man, I mean, it's been it's been amazing. It really has. Great, Nicole. Um, <clears throat> I will say that it, that it's it's really cool to hear all of your stories because there are elements that, from what I'm hearing um, from Carrie, I mean, Emma and Ken that uh, run true also with my story, which is really, it's cool to be last just as FYI. <laughs> so similar to, <laughs> similar to Carrie, um, I think my best decision was to uh, jump in coaching with both feet. Um, prior to coming to Middlebury, <clears throat> my husband and I were living in Texas and I was uh, coaching at a bigger, at a very big division one um, college and had recently finished my master's degree and we had a two year old. And my husband was offered a post position at the University of Vermont, like fully clear across the country and similar to Ken. Um, we have no family in Vermont or you might not either, but no family in Vermont, really and no family in New England. And um, having the opportunity then uh, to coach at Middlebury uh, and jumping in with both feet was the best decision I've ever made. Um, and the passion that for coaching that you can't really ignore that Emma alluded to um, was really what uh, drove me to make that decision with confidence. And so my husband and I, and my two-year-old, we moved to Middlebury um, and I, I started as a full-time assistant, which is a great position to land as the, it was wonderful that they had the opportunity to be a full-time assistant um, and the security that that entailed. Along with that, um, it was the fall of 2001. And so my husband was finishing some work in Texas, but because of 9-11, because of it was myself and my two-year-old for months and months and months without him and he was finishing in Texas. Um, but again, the best decision ever was um, with the decision to move across country um, and change, like make, make a decision to uh, jump into coaching. Um, I, it was a, one, besides uh, marrying my husband and other life choices, it was definitely one of the best decisions I've ever made. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so my decision was actually early in my career. I, I chose to leave a full-time coaching job for a very much part-time coaching job. <laughs> um, so right out of finishing my master's degree at UW La Crosse, which is where I, I went to school and um, I took a job out in upstate New York at SUNY Cortland and um, full-time teaching and coaching, great experience. And while I was out there, I was offered the opportunity to come back to my alma mater uh, to be the jumps and multis coach. Mm -hmm. The only catch was that it was very much part-time <laughs> at the time. Uh, <laughs> but I felt really strongly about just the timing of that opportunity to go back to the Midwest and to work with um, Pat Healy, who was my head coach, uh, to be mentored by him. So I, I took that leap and, and went back and while there were aspects that were comfortable about that, because I was familiar with the area and the program, um, I really had to figure out how to make ends meet and just do all those side gigs to, to focus on coaching, um, which I was able to do. So it was, it was worth it because in the end, it turned into a full-time coaching position. Um, it took a long time, but Coach Healy had my back and really advocated for me and really built that position into a full-time, into a full-time one. And I had a great mentor and I had, I gained a ton of experience um, in that position at lacrosse. So it was probably crazy of me to leave a full-time job and take a part-time, but um, just looking at the things that I was hoping to get out of that experience, it, I, I don't regret it for a second. So I'm very thankful that I have uh, Coach Steve Patrick as a as a friend today, I saw, I'm sorry I left you after one year at Cortland, <laughs> Steve. Um, but yeah, you just never know the timing of things. Um, so you don't kind of act and figure out what's important to you at that time um, in moving forward. 
I think one of the things too, with uh, the decision to become a coach, I just had this big pull in my heart, like a, this calling to be coaching. And I realized that coaching is teaching. You know, I was like, oh, I was going to have a classroom. That's what I went to school for. Um, but I just love the feeling of people working together towards a common goal and developing young people. And it just ended up when I was a GA, just seeing that excitement by the student athlete and working with the coaching staff that loved to see that um, improvement and loved to talk about track and field and wanted to like really support each other. That really got me excited about it. And then, you know, one of the things that, you know, when you look at making that decision to go somewhere farther away, like my husband, James and I were, um, James is assistant athletic director at North Central College now, but he was a former collegiate coach um, before he did that. But um, we both went to lacrosse and we're in grad school there. And we're like, you know, we're young, let's go for it. Let's go try somewhere else. And that's one of the things I tell you, I would really encourage younger coaches. If you have a chance, you may not seem like what you consider to be the ideal job. There's nothing ideal. Every opportunity gives you the opportunity to try something new and get better. And, you know, starting a team from scratch, um, I learned a lot. You know, one of the cool things with that was I went from a trophy, national trophy team as a GA to a beginning program that had never hadn't been there in 20 years. There's so many things that you can learn as a coach um, and decide what you want your path and your program to be like and really what you're about and your philosophy um, and take those best parts and you're going to make some mistakes. That was the cool part about going to Texas Lutheran. I had a really supportive uh, administration. One, they didn't have a lot of expectation in track and field at the time because, you know, it hadn't been there. But um, you're in Texas, for gosh sake, there's a lot there. You know, they, people love track and field. And um, I was really actually only hired for cross country and pushed my way into them adding track. Um, but is just take those chances. And when you say that big decision, then it leads to the next thing. And when you're all in it, wherever you choose to be, and you have full intention of being your very best and giving your best to yourself, to your staff, to your student athletes, to the institution, if something else comes about that seems like a better fit for you, or that you have the type of support that you want to make it to the next points, if that's what you choose in your path, um, that's okay. But um, when I look at that really cat, that that catalyst of making that decision just to take a leap of faith. And we moved to Texas with a U-Haul in mm. July with no place to live. If you ever lived in Texas and you live in a tent in <laughs> Texas in July, you don't live in a tent very long. Let's put it that way. Like two nights is enough, <laughs> but we just went for it and it was awesome. It was a great experience and the path to get back up, up to the Midwest at North Park university, coaching men and women cross country track and field they hired my husband as the full time, you know, we took another, we want to get closer to home, but you can't have me if you don't take him, <laughs> you know, like we need to be together. We were a package deal and um, it worked out great for us and to get back into the Midwest. And then our paths just kept, kept evolving into really an amazing place a great home at North Central for both of us. Um, it's just been amazing. I think, um, you know, one thing that I would, I would certainly echo echo what, uh, what Carrie said, um, but two things come, come to mind uh, for me. Um, one is the importance of having a support system. Um, you know, uh, you know, in, in this, in this move, um, in this, this, um, this step that we decided to make, um, you know, we both had to give up uh, some things. Um, you know, I mean, you know, living in Atlanta, um, you know, my wife, um, you know, enjoys shopping and, and restaurants and all those types of things. Mm -hmm. Um, um, but, you know, to move, to move outside of our comfort zone, um, you know, it had to be more than just, it had to be more than just about, about me. Um, you know, what were we gaining? Um, you know, this opportunity for us to, to, uh, to start a, start a new life, start a family, uh, to grow together, um, you know, friends, um, you know, I had a, a number of my friends that I could talk to and that, um, that would encourage me, um, that knew, you know, what my vision was and what I talked about. Um, pretty much, you know, the entire life, my entire life that I knew them. Um, and so they, they supported me in that, my family, the same thing. Um, you know, and then, and then the second thing I would say to that is, is, um, is that opportunity to grow. Um, it would have been, and I mean this, I mean this uh, uh, wholeheartedly, uh, it would have, it would have been easy for me um, to move back uh, to North Carolina um, after being in, 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 uh, in Atlanta for six years, uh, where it was comfortable. Um, where, you know, I went to school, uh, where my family was, uh, where I went to college, 
um, you know, where I grew up, it would have been easy for me to go back um, and and to and to uh, connect with people that I knew. Um, but I know without a shadow of a doubt um, that I would not have grown as a person. Uh, I would not have grown as a as a man, um, as a husband, as a father, um, and ultimately as a as a coach. Um, the way that I have here in, at Birmingham and uh, in, 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 at Birmingham Southern. Um, you know, I, I am not the same that I was when I was in college, and I think we all can say that. Um, but I say that because of um, because of the journey, because of the experience, um, you know, and, and, and that's why I, I'm, I'm so excited to be able to, to share, you know, this this as we all are uh, with those that are, that are, that are watching. Um, because, you know, sometimes, you know, oftentimes we have to, uh, we have to get out of our comfort zone. You know, we've got to step out and we've got to grow and we've got to be comfortable with that. Um, you know, you're not going to get all the answers, you know, they're not going to come to you. You're going to have to fall down. You have to take, you know, opportunities like, like what we're talking about um, to build a program. Um, we all go to meets where people don't know, you know, what our school's name is or where we, you know, where our school um, is located. Um, and I remember that, you know, like it was yesterday. Um, but it's not about that. You know, it's not about the name on your jersey. Um, you know, it's not about the size of your school. Um, when you start talking about just opportunities to grow as coaches, um, and um, and I, I would not have had that same opportunity um, if I had went back 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Um, I would not have had that same opportunity to be half of the man um, or, or the husband or father um, that I am that I am today. So um, you know, that's that's what I really wanted to wanted to you know share after hearing Carrie. Thank you. I think, yeah, that's a great segue um, into the next question. Just, you know, looking back on your coaching career and how it's progressed, what were some of those major factors you found yourself considering at various times? Um, Nicole, let's hear from you. <clears throat> so given that, um, you know, I was offered this opportunity to be a full-time assistant at Middlebury College and when I started at Middlebury College, um, the the women's cross country team had were reigning national champions, and you know, under the leadership of a very very well respected, incredible head coach um, Terry Aldrich and the track and field coach Martin Beatty. So I'm I'm coming into this program that's really really well grounded and very very successful. And they don't know me. They don't know my background at all. I'm trying to think like, okay, here's a super successful program. Um, I'm making the decision to come into it, but where am I going to, where's my niche? Like where, how can I help contribute to this program without stepping on anybody's toes and having and earning the trust um, from my, from the head coach that I'm working for, but also from the team. So without, um, and that took that, as an assistant coach coming into any program, um, it takes some time to observe and learn the program before, I, I, for me, it felt some time to learn about the program before I felt like, okay, here's where I can make some headway or, you know, I'm not going to come in like blasting through, but let me see where, let me see some inroads that I can make. So with keeping our women's, my thought was keeping the women's program as high in national class as we can, let's see what we can do to raise our men's program. And then, um, and con and contributing then to the success of the mid distance and distance runners on the, on a track, which um, Terry Aldrich, who was the head cross country coach, who is now the track and field coach. So it's kind of like finding my um, in a very successful and established program, finding my path. So as a result of that, um, when Terry Aldrich decided to, decided to retire in 2010, um, he felt very comfortable and um, most confident in handing the reins over as a head coach to me. And, and the, the reins were like, he had developed this program for 35 years. He was a head, head coach for 35 years, tremendously successful. And over the, as his assistant for nine years, we were able to elevate the men's program. And by, you know, it was, um, I wouldn't say necessarily, it was a vote of confidence, but it was also um, a nice segue for me to take the reins from Terry as his assistant for nine years to assume head coach. It, was a, it's, it is, continues to be a tremendous honor. Um, but I think careful, not, I'm not, <laughs> um, 
I think carefully navigating when you come into a new situation. So you have to earn, you have to earn respect and trust and not to have it expect, like not to expect to receive it right from the get go um, and to fit yourself into a program. So um, I think making those decisions again, great program. Let me see where I can find my, a way where I can make a positive uh, impact. And it resulted in me getting to be head coach of both programs now. Great. Emma, how about you? Yeah, so I kind of want to piggyback off Nicole there. Um, when I first started out at Pomona Pitzer, it wasn't a full-time position. So in the beginning, it was a, a, a bit challenging because I also had to find another means of like income. You know? <laughs> like you take on these side gigs and you, you know, you're working other jobs. I, I was also coaching at the high school level and I was also working as a as a shift supervisor at Starbucks at 3 a.m. And <laughs> so it was challenging. And being a new assistant coach into a program where they didn't have a, an assistant coach in, you know, in recent years, I also had to you know, step in and kind of observe and gain the trust of not only athletes, but you know, the head coach I was, wor I was working for. So it, it was challenging in the sense that I wanted to go all in with coaching but I side gigs, so I had to kind of balance things a bit. But um, the challenging part at first was just getting to know like the program, the philosophy, the culture, building these relationships with the athletes so they could, you know, gain my trust as well. And also, you know, learning how to work with alongside um, coach, head coach, uh, Kurt Reynolds, who has been a great mentor and someone who I can work really well with. So in the beginning, it just took some patience and just even kind of learning about myself as a coach, like what type of coach I wanted to be. And it was such an eye-opening experience because the athletes kind of help you find that, you know, they kind of help find who that is for yourself. So uh, I've been very blessed and fortunate to, you know, not only grow in the sport, but um, I feel very confident now with like the relationships I've built with my athletes. And as a result of that, um, I just wear various hats within our department now. So I no longer work at Starbucks and I don't coach at, a high school, at the high school level, but I, I now teach uh, PE classes and I teach faculty and staff uh, wellness classes. So I can use my coaching abilities to help the community not only our athletes, but serve the Pomona Pitzer college community. So that's been kind of like some of the, you know, not challenges, but things you encounter as a, an assistant and then kind of like gradually move up and then, you know, now we're here. <laughs> I can definitely relate with you. I worked at a coffee shop for four years and I loved it, <laughs> but it was definitely just like putting the time in and <laughs> figuring out how to make it work early on. Um, and I can relate and just, you know, the coaching position growing and becoming more full-time. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it, it also just teaches, like it, uh, it opens, you know, I don't know, for me, it was like, it just showed how important the coaching was to me and how much I was willing to sacrifice, like, you know, <laughs> my, my days by waking up super early and, getting the work done and then going out to coach in the afternoon and just luckily the coffee helped <laughs> all the caffeine keep me awake it still does exactly um, I think I think for me personally looking at where I'm at now in my career and reflecting on the last 13 years um, I've always been pulled toward division three I was a division three athlete and just really connect with the d3 philosophy but I have been able to explore some D2 and D1 opportunities. Um, ultimately, they either just didn't work out or they just weren't a good fit for me at that time. Um, but, you know, looking at where I'm at currently my position, the factors that are important to me right now in my career, I feel fortunate that I'm, I'm, I'm living it, I'm receiving it. Like, I feel very supported by the women's coaching staff um, in our program, I still feel like I'm being challenged in my role. Um, for me, switching event groups was part of that because I started off as a jumps multis coach and now I'm uh, sprints hurdles. 
I, I love living in the area here. Um, I enjoy that balance of teaching classes as well. But I think too, that's not to say that I'll be in this position or at this school forever. Like, I don't know what the future is gonna look like, but I think it's, a, somebody gave me advice one time, like you have to look at what's important to you right now and, and make sure that you're meeting those needs and be open to new opportunities that come up down the road. So I think I'm at a point where I'm, I'm allowing myself to just be present. I don't necessarily have like a super specific five year or 10 year plan and I'm okay with that because I know that I'm still preparing myself for potential opportunities that might come up down the road. Um, but yeah, I think when I kind of let go of, of just focusing on like really specific things, um, I've just been able to enjoy where I'm at right now and, and really like grow a little bit more in, in the current roles that I have. Mm -hmm. Kenneth, how about you? Well, you know, I, um, listening to you to you all and um you know i mean i was really it's interesting um because i i have you know similar experience um i think you know one of the one of the things that comes to mind for me um is is the um i guess the task that was at hand you know when we when i took this job uh, we were transitioning uh into division three um as an institution um the other uh, college had already done so but um but you know that transition takes two to four years before we're fully into um you know a conference and and also uh, eligible for nationals and so um you know when you take a job you're all excited um you know you, you're very um you know you have a lot of a lot of uh ideas about you know how do you want the program to be um but you know having to having to go out and uh, and talk about you know birmingham southern uh, recruiting uh, with a program that's new and, and, and refreshed, um, you know, I mean, it definitely has its challenges. Um, and so, um, you know, one thing that I had to, to had to decide um, is really, you know, how committed was I uh, to this? You know, I mean, I moved, you know, moved here. My wife and I moved here, um, and the first, you know, three or four years, um, you know, were challenging um, as it relates to establishing, a, you know, a program, uh, recruiting you know, on student athletes. Um, and even, you know, just even talking to some of my, um, my college teammates and, um, and, and even family, you know, they would always ask, well, you know, where's Birmingham Southern again? You know, like, uh, and, you know, what division are you guys? Um, and, and even, you know, uh, why Birmingham? You know, uh, why are you, you know, living all the way in Birmingham as opposed to, you know, just coming back, coming back to North Carolina or, or, or closer, closer to home? Um, you know, but, but, you know, my parents, you know, uh, taught me and, and, and raised me, um, you know, with, uh, with a mindset of being committed. Um, and, you know, if I'm going to um, take this opportunity um, and move, uh, you know, where no one knows, you know, who I am, um, and we've got to establish ourselves, um, you know, then, then, you know, uh, we also believe and we have faith that, um, that, that God will, will certainly take care of all of our needs. And so, um, in that first, you know, three or four years, uh, we went from, we went from, you know, uh, people still asking us, you know, what is BSC, what is Birmingham Southern, what division are you guys, um, you know, what do you coach, especially being in Alabama, like, like you coach football, like what do you coach? Um, and, uh, but, but going from that, those first couple of years um, and to, you know, and I think, you know, several of you guys know our first year of being eligible um, for a division uh, for a, the national championship was 2012. Um, and we went there, um, you know, the three athletes, uh, first time ever representing, um, you know, Birmingham Southern at a national level for track and field. Um, we walked away from there um, by God's grace with um, a national champion um, and, uh, and two uh, all Americans that finished third and fifth. Um, that was indoor. And then we went um, later on outdoor uh, out in California um, which was amazing, amazing time. And, um, and uh, I finished first in the 100 hurdles, uh, second um, in, the, uh, in, in the 200, and third in the 100. Um, and, uh, and, and here we are, you know, with national champions. Um, and things just kind of catapulted there. And so, you know, it really, again, um, you know, I don't just, you know, talk about, you know, stepping out on faith, but, 
uh, we got to walk it out. Um, and so, um, and, and that is, that's really, you know, um, that's really, you know, one of the toughest decisions that I had to make. Um, but it also, it really, um, you know, it changed, it changed my career, um, but also it changed the outlook, you know, because it's one thing to talk about it, but it's also another thing to have to like, you know, step out. And people look at you like, so you really going to do this? And, um, you know, we, 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 uh, we really went all in. Um, and he has continued to bless us uh, beyond measure. Carrie, what about you? Yeah, I kind of go back off of what Kenneth was saying with my family. My parents always had the door wide open for me to do whatever I wanted to do and believe that I could accomplish anything that I set my mind to as long as I worked at it and gave 100%. And that's just the way I live every day, pretty much. <laughs> you know, it's like from day one, they're like, you can be whatever you want to be. I don't think they expected that I move all over the country to coach initially, but honestly, they're really proud of that. I'm a female coach in a, in a collegiate world there, you know, there weren't many back when I started and there still aren't that many, unfortunately, or that stay in the profession women. But, um, I remember going to my first national meet with my, with Pat at lacrosse and we were at the coaches meeting and there's like, I know it was less than 10, but I think it was more like five females. And he, I remember him saying to me, you know, look around and you're one of them. And I was a GA, you know, so I wasn't a full-time coach yet, but I just know my parents just opened the door for me for anything I ever wanted to do from when I was a kid. I'm playing boys baseball and not playing softball part of the time. Like whatever I wanted to go for, I was, I could go try for it. And if I didn't do it, couldn't do it, I didn't get to do it, but I went for it. And that's where I really kind of go with these decisions. Like as you, the path you go through over this many years of coaching that I've had 25 um, every place I've gone to, it has been, I want to be the best that I can be wherever I am. You're going to make it what you're going to make it. Mm -hmm. You can be at an elite D3 school, D1, whatever. But if you're complacent at a place yeah. like that, you're not going to be doing service to the program and the institution and your student athletes and yourself. The same thing goes for programs that you start from scratch. I'm going to give 100%. You know, I hear a lot about balance and there's sometimes you don't have balance. It's not always a daily balance in different seasons of life within your profession. You're going to have different types of balance. But you also have to be willing to work at it. Like no one should expect just to get the job that they want just by because, you know, because I went to lacrosse, I should get this job. Big Absolutely. deal. You know, I mean, like great experience, but I have to earn it. And I have to you have to keep making the steps to get to the next point you want to be. And every job I took, I went in with the intention of staying at least five years, if not longer. And because I wanted it to be the team that I created and that I could impact. And as long as I, and I was clear within my, I feel I was clear within my interviews, as long as I felt supported by the administration, if I was giving you my best, that I would get the support to be able to reach the goals that we're setting together. And I knew what those were. And, um, but I, at the same time, I was never look, doing the job to get a new job my job was to do my best work for everybody involved and especially for my athletes. And um, if I didn't feel at some point that I, I needed, I had a little bit of a ceiling and I wanted, I had more in me to give, if I had a little bit more support then I was willing to look at those opportunities. Um, and I've done that throughout my career to get to North Central. And a lot of people I know are probably listening saying, yeah, you guys have everything at North Central. We do have a lot of a lot of uh, support and assets. We've worked really hard for that over a course of a long time. Um, but I didn't get that job by just showing up one day. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked to get to here over, you know, GA position and two other full-time positions to get to North Central. And then when I got to North Central in my first year, I taught 18 credits. I was assistant women's cross country coach. I was head track and field coach. My husband was coaching still at North Park. We had a baby of a few months old and he was driving to the city and I was driving out here. It was hard, you know, and over the course of 18 years of me being committed to North Central, my student athletes, to the mission of, of our institution's philosophy and really, you know, believing in it um, and really giving a lot of myself because it, my team is my family. It's an extension of my family. And I'm pretty sure everybody on this call thinks the same thing, mm -hmm. but um you know, I've also proven um, over time that I, I am a value to the student athlete. I am a value to the institution, you know, for what, what they would like to see come from North Central. And, um, you know, but that's also then gotten me to the point over the course of these years of getting to be, we don't teach anymore. 
you know, the, the, the value of the student, I would love teaching, but it's a lot, you know, and um, we have 70 plus women in our track and field team. We were, you know, when I came in, we were around 30, you know, around there. So over time we have built our program, but I was head, head track and field and assistant cross country to sports, you know, practices and meets in the fall and teaching a lot of credits and going out on the road, watching student teachers and having kids of my own um, over time by doing excellent work, you know, is it perfect? No, but my goal is to give my best. And if I do that and I, I can or have earned some of those opportunities to be able to be head women's track and field coach. I, I don't coach cross country anymore. I miss distance running. I love being with that group of women every day, but what's happened is I've been able to watch my own kids do sports in the fall where I can't the rest of the year. And that's where some of that balance came in where my ED, you know, we actually wanted a full-time coach um, for five years. We asked um, with proposals, how do we get a full-time throws coach and recruiting coordinator? Um, we had 20 plus throwers between men and women with a stipend coach. And um, we work really hard to pr provide quality athletes for all of our event coaches. And um, he's like, well, we can't do that right now, but I can, we, you know, I would like for you to consider not doing cross country and focusing solely on foul track and field and doing the things that you want to do to build that strong female connection with all of your student athletes. And I really valued that a lot that he was finding a way to at least somehow make it a better situation. And then, and it's a great situation already. I know my problems are, are ones some wish they could have, but um, the other, but we kept asking and this past year we got our full-time you know, recruiting coordinator and throws coach because of, we could prove the value that, you know, we've put in for many years um, through data, you know, as well, um, return on investment, all those things. So when you kind of look at the progression of stuff, I mean, I'm in a great place. I've been asked why, you know, why won't you apply for this job or what about this division or whatever? And I, the other things that have come into my, and I always thought I would maybe even think of those things more in my life. You know, you always try to think you want to go up the ladder, whatever that really means. I don't think there's an up the ladder. I think there's different paths for people's lives mm -hmm. and sometimes things change, but um, really my husband's assistant athletic director, director at North central. I get to see him basically every day. You know, he's not coaching anymore. He chose to leave coaching. So if somebody was home most of the time at least not traveling on the same weekends um, to go to games and stuff like that and meet. So he might be at a game, but our kids get to go to, or they gets to see one of us. Um, our kids get free tuition remission. Our son's running at North Central next year. Nice. How cool is that? I get to actually see him. You know, he may not think that, but um, <laughs> we get to see him. It's pretty cool. So um, there's a lot of benefits, but we've worked, I worked really hard to do that. You know, and it's, I don't take for granted any opportunity I've been given small or big to make it the best. And I think that, you know, all of you guys are in the same boat. So I think that's a good lead into our next question. Um, just sharing some of the experiences that you've been through. What have you found particularly challenging at various points in your career? Um, even thinking like, how have some of those challenges evolved over the years too? So I might throw it right back to you, Carrie. Uh, for this one yeah um I would say there's I've, there's always a you know, coaching is challenging in different ways but I look at it as a real gift I mean it's a lifestyle choice it's a it's not really a job if you treat it like a job um you're missing most of the joy of what we do and the frustration but the the joy but I've had you know I kind of when you gave me this question I had two specific things that I came back to that I I really have had as challenging times and one of them may be a little surprising to some but um, several years ago, James and I lost a son at full term. It was a weekend of a meet the weekend before conference indoor. And you have all the joy of your, your team and they're excited about it all. And, um, you know, you go to the hospital and then you find out that it's not going to be the way you expected it to be. And I remember I, my, I'll tell you a great thing about North Central who showed up to my, to my, uh, hospital room the next day, the president, the president of our college came to see me with a gift and, the first day I went back to work, a, a month after I got out of work or came back to work, I, I, I took a month off. He was right in my office that first day welcoming me back. Um, that was that said a lot to me. It should tell a lot of people what type of place North Central is. But um, I remember thinking at times, what am I doing? Like, what's so valuable about my life? Like, I coach people to run fast and win meets. Like, that's, that's a point I felt in my heart at that time. You know, I, I was a little bit younger as a coach. It's been 16 years since that happened. 
um, over time, I've clearly, uh, I'm still here. And um, I was trying to figure out what my bigger purpose was at that time. And then what I realized was really my purpose was to be a strong leader for women to know that you can, you're going to endure big things in life that is not about not losing a race or getting an injury that are much bigger and that we have a true gift to be student athletes and to want to be at our very best and to celebrate those things. Um, and that you, because of what we're made of as athletes, that when big things come in life as adults, we are able to handle things. Even with this COVID, I had a talk with my team last night on a Zoom call. I said, you're not normal people. You guys are student athletes. We learn to deal through adversity. We learn to work through things. We learn to become better, mold ourselves and evaluate who we are and what we want to become through challenges in life. Um, so that's, you know, one of my big ones. And I, you know, I think I, I had a renewed focus on what my coaching role was. The outcome is awesome. I, I think initially I was wanting to prove that I could be a good coach because our, the coach before me, Marcy was amazing and had a lot of success and everybody loves Marcy. And I, you know, you always want to try to live up to that. When I kind of let that go and really refocused on my true purpose and value, that really helped. But um, the other thing it really is something I see maybe more with women. I, men, I can't speak for you, but, um, you know, this is a world where there are a lot of male coaches, you know, collegiate coaching and track and field, any sport you go into. And I found over the years that you get so focused on being a coach and giving, giving, and giving to your athletes and wanting to, to do your very best that I wasn't taking the time to make um authentic friendships with women um and the way i always felt like i needed to be the mentor and the one that people wanted to come to and pe the one that would lead and guide and you know i was i was forgetting myself and sometimes it came comes down to making you know connections within our coaching world and having friends but also i found some real value in making friendships outside of coaching um you know where we'd be at a track meet my all my girlfriends were out to dinner you know, or they were watching a movie together. Well, we, you know, we miss a lot of that um, or play dates with your kids. And, but it's taking those opportunities, you know, as a female coach to still find connections of other meaning in your life um, and other outlets. And I'm sure men, you feel the same way, but um, being able to find yes, opportunities to say yes to, to make those authentic connections and friendships, because we're more than coaches, you know, and um, we become better people and coaches when we have other support. Um, and people that we can connect to and confide in. And that's one of the things I really neglected for a long time. Um, and I'm really blessed and thankful that I've found my way back to uh, seeing the value of that. Great. Uh, Nicole, how about you? Um, Carrie, I'm sorry for your loss and I wish I was your athlete. Oh, <laughs> that was awesome. Um, so like Carrie alluded to um, with the coaching, being pr primarily male dominated, I think that's, um, I think it's uh, more prevalent at maybe other divisions at, and at division three, um, there are greater number of female coaches, but as a female coach coaching um, a men's team, uh, and this is maybe more 10, 12 years ago, the assumption that <clears throat> as a female coach, I just coached the women's team. Um, I wouldn't say that was a challenge. It was really just annoying. Um, and I've always had a male assistant coach. And when you go to, when I went to, when we went to a place that was unknown or even like the bus driver, they would always, the assumption that the male coach, that my assistant was a head coach. Um, again, it was just annoying since I've been, um, on the coaching block now for almost 20 years, uh, people know I coach both teams and that's fine. That's not as much. Um, I don't, I don't encounter that as much. Um, but it is it's uh, great that we have more women coaches and to encourage um, both genders to continue to coach. The other more personal challenge, and I think Carrie alluded to this um, to a great extent, and I appreciate how um, vulnerable you made yourself, um, is uh, I coached three seasons and I'm gone most Saturdays from Labor Day to Memorial Day. And I'm also gone most Friday nights where I can't fall asleep watching a movie with my family. Mm -hmm. um, but I missed a lot of, we have two boys um, and I missed a lot of their games and our practices and um, you just miss a lot. So I was fortunate to not have that challenge be something that I couldn't overcome. My solution was I was able to take a day off during the Monday through Friday. My, our administration allowed that. I normally took off on Fridays. And when my kids were, you know, kindergarten and younger and in daycare, they just didn't go to daycare that day. 
Um, and I was fortunate to have that time with them because I didn't have that Saturday with them. One of the best things of coaching, um, not best things of coaching, but one of the perks of coaching is I was a lot, my schedule, schedule is so flexible. Like you're never really off duty, but then um, you can control when you're on. So I was always able to pick up my kids from school and particularly my youngest, as soon as I picked him up from school, everything that happened just fell out of his mouth. I <laughs> um, and, you know, um, and it was great just like I would have like 45, 50 minutes with him before I had to go to practice. Um, and those proved to be really valuable with both my kids. Um, but having um, my husband, Keith, where he didn't necessarily see it as a challenge that I was done at, on Saturdays. He, again, he took, he did everything with the boys. He um, took them soccer to ski practice. They would go to some of our meets. Um, they just, that was part of our life. And um, for me, it wasn't a challenge, but I could see having kids for any gender. This is definitely not just a female, but having a kids and coaching full time is difficult to manage because the hours are so difficult and, and you are gone on when other people have their weekend off, that's really when you're on. So um, yeah, those are two not um, very different. One is professional, one is personal. Um, neither one of them are challenges that were not, I wasn't, that are not, that are easy, able to be overcome, um, but that, that have presented themselves in my career. Anas, how about you? Um, yeah, uh, one challenge for me, um, and, it, and, I, and I appreciate too, I certainly appreciate uh, um, you know, both uh, Nicole and Carrie, you know, sharing, um, and that's, part of the reason why I was smiling. I think, you know, early on in my coaching career, um, I realized um, the importance of, of family, um, but even even uh, the importance of, of uh, even marriage, a healthy marriage. Um, you know, I mean, my parents uh, have been married, man, 43, 44 years, um, and um, which is, certainly a blessing. Um, but also like all of my coaches that impacted my life, um, uh, my high school coach, God rest his soul. Um, uh, my head, uh, uh, track and field coach, um, at UNC, um, passed this past, um, uh, uh, this past August, God rest his soul. But, um, and, um, and then even the assistant coaches, coach Fry, like they were all coaches that were, that were married. Um, and they, um, you know, valued family. Uh, they valued um, their wives, their relationship with their wives, uh, with their kids. And so, me being a young coach, um, and uh, and and having seen that in my past, um, but but then, you know, my first couple of years, you know, everybody was young. They were young coaches. Um, you know, they were out, you know, dating, or we go to conventions, and everybody's gonna you know, uh, hanging out and, and, and stay in the lobby and, and all that stuff, as, as you know, um, how, how people do at conventions. But, um, but you know, like the, the picture that I was, that I appreciate that I was around, the mentors um, that really poured into me, um, those were all, all men um, that, that valued that, um, that appreciate that. And so, um, you know, when we started traveling, we were recruiting and different things like, like that. Um, and my wife, you know, I mean, she's professional. I mean, she's a, uh, she graduated from UNC Chapel Hill um, as I did. Um, and, and she's a, she's a physician. Um, but there were things that, that she wanted to do as well. You know, she wanted to grow, um, you know, personally and professionally and, and look at different, different things. And so um, it wasn't about, it had, it couldn't be about me. Um, it couldn't be about, you know, uh, me always, you know, trying to recruit a kid and miss out on, on, you know, uh, a symposium that she was a part of or, or an event that she was, that she was putting on. Um, as our kids grow now, uh, you know, I mean, I've got, we've got three kids, um, 12, nine and five. Um, and they're very active. Um, they got it honest. It's in their blood. Um, but like, you know, um, wanting to be a part of that um, because you hear about it all the time, you know, Somebody told me that today, um, you know, um, you know, 
uh, my five-year-old daughter. I mean, she she just got an award um, from from the city uh, for a character award, um, and um, you know, and, and and he told me to say, you know, you blink, man. That kindergartner will be a freshman in college, um, and uh, and I think about that. And so, some of the hardest decisions that I've had to make, but the most rewarding ones was was really uh, being intentional about about being a um, being first and foremost, um, you know, um, a man of God, um, but also being a husband to my wife, um, you know, a father to my kids, um, and then lastly, you know, be uh, be the head coach here at Birmingham Southern. Um, and I say that unapologetically, you know, um, you know, and, 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 and that was, it's tough because it's not popular, you know, like sitting around with a bunch of, uh, coaches, um, particularly male, but just coaches in general, but especially male. And you're like, man, I, I you know, I got to call my wife. I got to go, you know, I can't miss out on a, on a baseball game or a track meet, um, or, you know, going to lunch you know, with my kindergarten, um. You know, we're being intentional about that because at the end of the day, um, you know, um, championship or not, um, you know, uh, head coach, you know, of the year, um, you know, whatever the case may be, whatever my status is, um, when I walk in that door um, after, you know, getting a big recruit or, or, uh, or not getting a, getting a recruit, um, you know, I'm still, I'm still a husband um, and I'm still daddy. To, to my three kids um, and uh, and they're they're going to be the ones that are going to be there with me and for me through the big t- you know through, through the good times and also the bad times um, and uh, and I'm looked at you know as their as their hero you know um, and the funny thing is and this will kind of put things in perspective um, and I'll let someone speak but you know my, my 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 son's name is Evan Miles Cox and on his papers uh, at school, his name is his name is Evan Miles Cox. He writes Kenneth Evan Miles Cox Jr. And that's that's that, that's his name that he writes. Mm-hmm. And it's not a legal name, but you know, um, and that means something. You know, like it's not you know that is the head coach of you know Birmingham Southern. Like don't care about all that. Like he, you know, like that means something to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think at the moment. At the moment when, when, uh, when that changed for me, that shift, um, you know, years back, um, you know, like I said before, it just changed my whole perspective, you know, on things. Um, it, it really does. So, you know, like when I say like my heart goes out and I, I really understand what you guys mean, um, it's that sensitivity um, that you have to have in this world. You know, we coach, you know, I coach men and women, you know, um, these are going to be, uh, you know, leaders of tomorrow. And I think about, some of the best times of my life, you know, where me as a student athlete, um, you know, the good times, the bad times, um, and, and some of the, those relationships that I draw on, um, you know, those, those, those memories, you know, they come from practice, they come from road trips, they come from, I mean, you know, we were all at a, at a funeral, you know, back in August. Uh, we didn't have social media back then, you know, it was the first time we had seen each other in, in 20 some years. Um, and we just, that's all we talked about, you know, is just that time. And so, um, so anyway, my, I guess my, my, my point is, is that, but we, we saw family and that means something, you know, we talked about our coach and how, you know, how great he was and, and, and just how he brought us all together. Um, and I want to be that, I want to be that coach. You know, I, I, you know, I believe that we're going to continue to have success. Um, but the success that I have um, and the, and the most meaningful, uh, um, um, you know, moments really, or when my guys come back after graduating and say, you know, coach, you know, um, you know, I'm getting married uh, or I'm having a, a child. My wife and I are having a child um, or even most recently, I mean, I give my life to Christ and I'm like, wow, like we didn't necessarily talk about that, but I lived, it, you know, like, and I try to live it every single day. And so, um, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's my perspective. Awesome. Emma, how about you? Well, first, uh, thank you, you three, for talking about just the importance of family and just balance. Because personally, I don't have any kids, but um, I come from a a big family. And when I first started coaching, there were times where I missed out on some, you know, big family gatherings and events or arrived late because of coaching. Um, 
as you all said, coaching isn't one of those typical jobs where you clock in at eight and leave at five. It's a, you're constantly coaching. You're constantly there for your athletes. And a lot of our events occur on Saturdays and that's when a lot of family gatherings occur. So when I first started coaching, I had to realize that and kind of find a balance because my family is very important to me. Where I coach right now at Pomona Pitzer, I actually grew up in Claremont. So my whole family lived there. So what I started to do is not only build relationships with my athletes, but I, you know, my family knew about my job and the importance of my athletes. So what did I do is uh, we just combined the two and we just became a bigger family. So we started creating traditions where the team would go to my cousin's house for Halloween and we were all dressed up and it became a tradition that we now have to this day. Uh, my family comes to meets and they, like my nieces and nephews know about running and they come dressed up in orange and blue. So that was, you know, now that I look back at it, I never thought it would get to that point because for me as a coach, family is very important. Um, our athletes are an extension of our family. Um, I don't coach the athlete, I coach the individual. I, I, I love building relationships with the athletes I coach and getting to know their families. And a lot of our athletes, you know, they're from out of state and they, they live on campus and they don't have their family there. But they've come to know my family and, you know, I ask them how their families are and they, they ask me how, you know, my grandma is. And they've met her and she's 98 years old and she knows about our team and was just such a great learning experience and I'm constantly learning about that but just how I can combine my family with the athletes I coach and just to make it a bigger family but yeah I, I agree with all of you of just trying to find that balance at first it's a it's a bit challenging but we get it done you know as coaches we figure it out um thank you all for sharing your stories I think we're doing exactly what I'd hoped for, just being able to relate with one another and um, even just connect with other coaches who are watching right now too, just with the specific um, stories and experiences that we've all um, had ourselves. Um, I'm going to take my story in a little bit different direction, talking about personal challenges within the profession. Um, I went through a, a couple years where I really struggled, just like understanding and feeling my value as a coach. And um, that was a really hard time and it took a while to like work through. Um, so I had, I had worked at lacrosse and I had an incredible mentor in Pat Healy. Um, when he retired, I was the interim head coach for a year. And then um, that was a really challenging time. I just, I, looking back on it, I, I felt like isolated and just kind of lost, like um, just like lack of guidance. Um, and so from that experience, I ended up not getting the full-time position and I just, I felt really lost. Like, what am I doing? Do I even belong in this profession? Um, and it was incredible. All the people that like came forward and, and showed their support and helped me understand my value as a coach. Um, people who were coming and saying like, you can't leave the profession. You have to stick with coaching. And I didn't understand it at the time. Like, why are they saying things like that to me? Um, but, you know, I could have in that in that situation, I could have very easily picked up and gone elsewhere to take another job, but I wasn't in a good place to make a major decision like that. Um, so I've been really fortunate because I chose to stay and I've been able to build a really great relationship with the new head coach, Nick Davis. Um, and he's done a great job supporting me and I'm, I've been feeling that support. I think if I if I hadn't felt that genuine support, I don't know if I could have stayed. Um, but I've been fortunate to, to build that bond and then also strengthen relationships with coaches from like other schools and across the country too, who I consider great friends and mentors myself. Mm -hmm. um, and they really helped me reaffirm my purpose as a coach. And in turn, it's become more important to me now at this point in my career that I'm turning around and doing that for other coaches. Yep. Um, understanding that if I can use my voice, if I can be a role model, if I can be a mentor for other coaches, I want to be able to do that. And, you know, especially for women in the profession, it's like, you know, Carrie, you touched on it earlier. Um, and Nicole too, like, 
we're seeing more women in the profession now compared to 10, 20 years ago. But um, even within my own conference, I remember a time we had four female head coaches and now we have one. Like I don't, looking back, like I haven't had a lot of role models, you know, in our conference. And it's been cool because I have, it's forced me to kind of look beyond the conference to find some other role models too. But now I make a little bit more of an effort. I'm more intentional trying to reach out and make connections with, with other coaches, you know, at my own school and other sports um, across the conference and region and nationally too. So I, I look forward to things like convention and national meets um, to be able to see other coaches and, and build those relationships. But um, I think that'll take us to our last question, a little segue here. What do you think can be done by head coaches or administrators or institutions to encourage and empower coaches to remain in the profession? Uh, let's start first with Kenneth on this one. Um, I, I would say, you know, uh, probably, I mean, one of the things that I, that I had to do, and really that is, um, is really, you know, get involved. Um, you know, that's one of the things that it kind of has, has, um, has rejuvenated or rejuvenated, rejuvenated me, um, you know, a couple of years back in terms of, um, you know, my commitment to coaching. Um, you know, our athletic director always talks about, you know, getting involved um, in, our, in our sport. Um, uh, our previous athletic director did the same thing. Uh, my mentors do the same thing. And that is what I'm talking about specifically, you know, is, um, you know, a couple of years back, um, you know, we get you, we get used to going to the convention. Um, and I know I talked about it before we go, you talk going to the convention, uh, sitting around in the symposiums and uh, kind of, you know, catching up with our, our coaching buddies. Um, but from, you know, my advice uh, really would be, um, you know, to get involved with your sport. Um, you know, uh, some of the things that we talk about, some of the challenges that we have, um, they're not going to fix themselves if we don't, if, if we don't uh, take a leadership role in that. Um, and so uh, I guess about eight years ago, um, I, you know, I made a decision to, to be a, um, a regional rep, you know, for track and field. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it's, it's not always, at least back then, it wasn't, you know, one of those things that everybody kind of jumped that opportunity of doing because mm -hmm. you got to go to a convention and go to meetings and, um, and get on conference calls. Um, you know, that first, after that first two years, I, 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 you know, decided that I, again, I was all in and stayed for another two years. Um, after that, you know, I was uh, uh, um, advised and, and elected to be, um, you know, the second vice president. Um, and, and fast forward to now, uh, I'm the vice president, you know, over track and field. And the things that I've learned through that time, it's not just about Birmingham Southern. Um, it's not just about the Southeast uh, and the region that we're in, but it's about bettering our sport. Um, and so for me, understanding, you know, what the sport is about, uh, understand, understanding how we can affect change um, as opposed to just, you know, paying our money and going to a convention and, and uh, just hanging out, you know, for an entire week, on which I, I mean, that's what people want to do. That's totally fine. But, you know, for me, um, we want to advance our sport and we're going to make it better um, than, than, than I would say not just be, you know, be a participant, uh, we'll be involved in, in making our sport better for, for our athletes, for coaches, having opportunities to advance, to get involved, to make changes if we need to, um, and also to, to meet some amazing people. Um, that are just as valued and, and dedicated in the sport. So, I mean, that would be uh, that, that. That's 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 my uh, um, you know that would, that would be my recommendation. Thank you, Emma. How about you? I'm fortunate enough to work in a department where all the coaches, regardless of what sport it is, encourages each other to grow. So, I would encourage you know athletic departments, colleges, institutions to encourage uh, coaches, not just head coaches, but assistant coaches to attend conventions, to maybe put some talks at the school or just lead discussions uh, during training sessions, even if you're an assistant coach. Uh, that's how I've grown in the sport where I've been asked to lead discussions with you know, our athletes about workouts and also putting together 
uh, training programs for the summer. So those are great opportunities to allow for growth. But yeah, I mean, just allow individuals to seek out, you know, opportunities for growth. Like I said, like either attending the convention or um, clinics and just, yeah. And, and also just having a good support system. So that, that would be my suggestion. Nicole? Um, so I'd say that what, to, what a head coach or uh, administration, college or an association can do would be um, to provide a space uh, for a coach to be successful. And that, um, and understanding that success can be, can vary from program to program and, and institute to institute, but um, give us, give a space for a coach to be successful. And that can be success, success can be in terms of like admissions or some finances or um, practice times or like a field time, like uh, again, provide a place for success. And then also I think ed continuing education for all coaches is really, really important, whether it's hands-on or through lectures. Um, and one of the coaches said alluded to it, one of the colleagues on this panel alluded to it before, like you can learn a lot from a great coach and you can learn a lot from a coach who you don't think is a great coach in terms of how you want to develop your program. So that would be more hands-on learning and then also uh, learning through lectures. And I would say that um, providing continuing education in both, both areas is important for any head coach, regardless of whether you're a head coach, whether you're an associate head coach. Because um, in my opinion, if you are really set in your ways of coaching and not learning, that could, um, your program can become stagnant and not continue to grow, which again, just in my opinion, then could be the downfall of a program if, if a program and a coach is not willing to evolve and are continuing to learn. Yeah, I think I, got. I, I look at this um, question from, you know, somebody being newer or younger in the profession and those who have more experience. I think anybody who has experience or are in some sort of leadership position, I think it's really important they understand that they can have a huge impact on the development of younger coaches or newer coaches. Um, and so I think just encouraging others to pursue coaching and to stick with it, if that's what they, if they have a desire for it. Um, I think if you're in that position, learning how you can better support another coach in their current role, but also help them prepare for future job opportunities at the same time too. I think don't assume anything. Um, don't assume they, they want to take a different, a specific direction, right? Yeah. Have those conversations with your colleagues. Um, I think using your connections, you know, I think back to when I started coaching, um, Coach Healy made sure that I was able to go along to all of the major championship meets, conference and national meets. He said, you're coming with me to the coaches meeting, you're coming with me to this. And he just started introducing me to people. And it's so cool because I've developed like friendships with with colleagues from that, um, you know, 10 plus years ago. But he didn't have to do that, but it was important that he helped me get my foot in the door. He helped me um, just, you know, get into the track and field community in that sense. So I think using your connections and introducing, you know, your colleagues to other coaches and leaders in the sport and being an advocate, you know, whether it's another coach on your staff or, or another colleague in another school, being an advocate for one another encouraging them to be an advocate for themselves as well. And I think that's something where as an assistant coach who's been in that role for a while, just in the last couple of years, I've, I've grown a lot and done a lot better job just advocating for myself and uh, putting myself out there a little bit more. But I, I couldn't have done that without the support I was receiving from other coaches too. So Carrie, I'll toss it over to you. Yeah, I look at um, my role as a head coach um, for with people that I work with. My I've always looked at it as my goal for my graduate assistants or my assistant coaches to give them the tools and opportunity to become excellent at what they want to do, um, to help them to become successful and really understand where they want to go with their path. Like my assistant coaches aren't there for me to look good. My I am there to help them be their best and provide. For them what they need to be successful 
and I want to acknowledge what they bring. And I think it's really important as head coaches that we can see the value of what our assistant coaches and graduate and graduate assistants bring every day as, you know, as coaches, not as someone who just fills the lockers with, you know, the gear or with getting some paperwork done, but how they relate to the students and what they mean to, to the students. Um, but I've always felt it as my role. What do you want to do with your career? Where do you see yourself wanting to be? Like actually talking to my GAs or my assistant coaches. We have mostly our you know stipend coaches that have other jobs. Well, do you want to become a coach full time? Do you are you happy in this role? But I've also made it a big part of why I want my coaches to stay because I bring them really good athletes. I want to recruit in good athletes for them to coach. So when they come to practice, it's exciting. Whether they're really good athletes or people that have great attitudes that come to practice that want to be coached, either way but they have quality people to work with. And then that makes them happier to come to work with when they're on a couple thousand dollars stipend or if they're full time either way. But the goal is to get them ready for their next step. It's not to, to hoard them to myself. It's to make this place as great as it can be and to help them be able to have an awesome resume for their next role that they want. And if they choose to stay with us because they love it, then great for us. Um, but it's not for me to like, uh, I might, I don't want to hold people back and down. I want it to be able to have them grow. And I think that's a really important role that head coaches have. And sometimes we miss because we have 5 million things going on and we just need them to coach this area and get this done and, you know, make sure we recognize our GAs and assistants, um, or, you know, people that we're working with and the work they're putting in. But I also think I've also noticed people want to know what they're doing well and the things they got to work on. We can be great friends with our colleagues in, in our office, but we have to be willing to be challenged to be better too. Like I, our uh, new recruiting coordinator, he was my GA and was amazing GA. He went away for two years as a full-time head coach, men and women cross country track and field. And then our opening came and he chose to come back to the, the culture that we have at North Central. And, but I'm like, I tell him all the time, like if I'm missing something or if you think I should do something differently, tell me, I'm only going to get better, but you have to be able to be able to work with people to help keep motivating and being honest about doing quality work, but also about things that we, we want to do better. But, um, I really look at, uh, you also, as a, as a person, as a coach an assistant or head coach, if you want more in the position you're at, whether you're head or assistant, or you would like something more in the job as an assistant, you got to be willing to show your value. Yeah. And um, I did talk about this on the women's summit we had at um, convention and it's like on paper, what is your return on investment? I mean, you need to be able to say, I'm bringing in 10 kids and our school makes, I'm just throwing a number out there, $15,000 per student. This is how much money I'm bringing into the institution every year through my recruiting. This is how many points my athletes are scoring in their events at the conference meet or at the national meet. This is um, the, how many people we're retaining every year. Like, if you're like an assistant coach and you feel undervalued, you also have to be willing to show why your head coach should consider either a job title change for you, a salary, or why you should be looking somewhere else for a job that maybe you can utilize your full, you know, resources to be at your best, but don't, you need to be able to put it on paper. And that's, you know, we, that's some, how we got our other position for that full-time uh, throws position and recruiting coordinator was demonstrating the value that we were having you know, um, where we've come from to where we were, um, and what it meant for the institution and for our program. So, uh, but I just think as, as we're always sometimes afraid, I'm, I'm not a big bragger by any means, but I learned I have to put it on paper to be objectively show what we can do, what we've done. Um, so we're all close friends. I think we're with people we work with, but we also have to be able to be professional and talk about, you know, what are the goals that you have, you know, individually, what do I want you to do as a head coach? You know, where do you want to see yourself in five or 10 years? You know, like, how can I help you get there? And I hope you want to stay here, but I'm going to help you become the best you can be so you can make that decision for yourself. So, and at the same time, then we're, we're doing great, you know? So those are some things I think it's just listening and showing value, but also helping teach. You know, I, I believe in USUCA. I've been going to convention for 21, 22 years, 23 years, I don't even know anymore. And um, I believe in coaching education. There's so much value from that. And at the same time, within our own little pockets where we work, like challenging each other to be at our best, acknowledging when we are, 
we're having a little bit of a rough time. Like, how can I help you to get to the next point? You know, or I'm seeing this, maybe you're not. Um, but I think that's, that helps us also keep people in the profession because they feel true, authentic connections with the people they work with and people that care about, um, you know, their, them as a person and as a professional. Great, a lot of great points um, that everybody's made here. Um, do any of you have anything to add to it before we wrap up? I just I would say apply for whatever you want to apply for. There's no job too small or too big. Don't think any program isn't worth trying for. If it's not your dream school, it could become your dream school because there's a lot. It's you who brings it there, and you know every division is different. You're you. What? There's no one path. Everybody has a different path and your path may change based on circumstances in your life. So um, follow the path that, that you want. And if you don't get the job, you don't get the job. You don't put your name out there, you don't get it. But if you don't put your name out there, you're definitely not going to. Great. Well, thank you all again uh, for taking part in this today. I, I learned a lot about, <laughs> about all of you and it was great just learning more about your stories and your experiences. And um, I think Carrie, what you said is right. Like everybody's path is different and it's, it's just owning your journey and knowing that um, like it's your journey. It doesn't, it's not anyone else's. And um, you know, finding the right people to support you, that support system is, is such an important component um, in doing what we do and being able to be at our best in the profession as coaches because that's how we're going to give the best to our student athletes. Um, and that's really what it's all about, I yeah. think. So thank you all for taking part um, in our talk today. Thank you so much for inviting us on this panel. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you everyone. Stay safe. <laughs>